Hello, you're watching New Vision TV News. We are coming to you from the New Vision newsroom. I am Ruth Nasajeta. Let's take a look at the news. Now, 40 years ago today, the first cabinet after the fall of Idi Amin's military government was already fracturing even before spending one week in office. Many Ugandans wonder why the first cabinet disappointed Ugandans so quickly. Later in the bulletin, New Vision TV looks at the cabinet's very composition in whose very DNA the, the problem was embedded. Now let's take a look at the news around Uganda. We start from Yumbe district where with the key principles of the South Sudan conflict edging closer to the lasting peace deal. The state minister for disaster preparedness says Uganda has no plan to send refugees from the war ravaged country back home against their will. Now Musa Echeru gave the assurance to a group of South Sudanese refugees at BDBD refugee settlement in Yombe district. He stressed that no refugee will be forced to return home, saying that if peace returns in their countries, Uganda will instead send leaders from among the refugees to assess the situation first before a decision to return is reached. In August last year, South Sudanese President Salva Ki and his Accra rival Riyak Masha signed a power sharing agreement that is appearing to hold after more than three attempts failed. Uganda is home to 100.25 million refugees, a majority of them from South East Sudan, a country torn by half a decade of civil strife. Refugees and asylum seekers from South Sudan are accommodated at different settlements in settlement, sorry, in West Nile and northern Uganda. News from Kampala. To combat the stealing of babies, the management of Kawem Perifar Hospital has decided to install CCTV cameras in the gynecology and pediatric center. Theft of babies has been rampant in Kampala's public hospitals. This involves women who turn up to hospitals pretending to be caretakers and unsuspecting mothers leave them with their babies. There have also been cases of collusion by the staff. Dr. Lawrence Kaziwe, the deputy director of Kawem Perifar Hospital, says the facility was hit by, by frequent baby thefts last year, prompting management to come up with a solution. With the CCTV cameras installed, it is hoped the hospital's dented image will be restored and mothers will again be assured of the safety of their babies. Now, since its completion in 2016, the number of patients visiting the hospital has grown. It is the first public hospital to be built in Kawempe, a division in Kampala, as part of the decongestion of decongesting Mulago National Referral Hospital, which will concentrate on complicated cases only. Now, Kurudu in Makindi and Naguru are other hospitals in Kampala built to revive Mulago as the pressure from the growing number of patients. News from Bujiri District. Now residents of Bujiri Municipal Council have a reason to smile after the Turkish non-government organization constructed 14 boreholes to serve a population of over 5 thousand people. Residents in Bujili Municipal Council have been working for over 1.5 kilometers in search for clean water for domestic and also that for domestic use. Now the boreholes were commissioned by officials from Mustafa Savsin SV, Kiyusu Kestobusa, a Turkish non-government organization amid its cheers and relations from members of the public at Busazi Primary School. Legos. News from Sorority District. Now the new Sorority Fruit Factory is set to change the fortunes of fruit farmers in Teso subregion. Located at Eliot Village, Arpai subcount in Sorority District, the factory was commissioned by the President Jeremy Seven on Saturday and will be processing different fruits into juices and concentrations. The 48 billion shilling factory has an installed hourly processing capacity of six metric tons of oranges and two metric tons of mangoes. Currently, the factory is only processing oranges and mangoes, but it can also process other fruits such as pineapples and passion fruits. Annually, it will consume 129,000 metric tons of oranges and mangoes. <laughs> In Mukono District, the State Minister for Primary Education, Rosemary Seninde, has warned heads and appropriators to continue teaching out of the normal stipulated school time organized by the Education 
ministry. She stated that such heads should stop or face disciplinary action. Senita said many schools today start receiving children as early as 5 a.m. for what they call morning preps and release those in primary 6 and 7 at 10 p.m. in the night, something she said is illegal and dangerous to the lives of those children. Senator made the remarks while addressing her teachers from Mukono Municipality in the sensitization conference organized by Mukono Municipality Primary School Head Teachers Association. We go to Akiso District where the head of research in traditional medicine in the Ministry of Health, Dr. Grace Nambatia, has urged traditional healers and herbalists in the country to preserve the environment. She pointed out that traditional medicine is gold from green cover, but to her dismay, forests and wetlands are being destroyed. According to Nambatia, their capital is in environment, and once the environment is destroyed, traditional medicines would be no more. Nambatia made the remarks during the traditional healers meeting that was intended to sensitize traditional healers on how they can preserve the environment. News from Kabale District, Monsignor John Mary Chitone Kabiaga, the Kabale Vicariate Episcopal Vicar, has called on Christians to use the Holy Week and Easter festives to spearhead the fight against discrimination, jealousness, violence, intrigue, and selfishness. Monsignor Kabiaga made the call while giving the sermon to a congregation during Palm Sunday service at Bujuni Catholic Parish in Kabali District. Monsignor Kabiaga, who is also the parish priest at St. Teresa Bujuni Catholic Parish, called on Christians to preserve and value God's creative features by planting trees and practicing good methods of farming to minimize diverse effects of drought and global warming. Finally, from Gulu District, now residents of Gulu were so excited to see the Kira EVS, a Ugandan made car that was showcased at Kawunda Grounds in Gulu Town on the weekend. Jeffrey Court, the resident of Gulu, said making Kira EVS shows that Uganda is developing like other countries. He said the innovation will make Uganda save money that they spend in they spend on importing vehicles from other countries. Liadoro Komakech, the Gulu Municipality MP, who welcomed the team of the Kira Motors in Gulu at Kawunda Grounds for the exhibition, said Uganda is on the right track of innovation and improvement of technology that can now produce cars. That is all I had for you for the news around Uganda. Let us now take a look at the news around East Africa and around the world. Hello, you're watching New Vision TV. This is News Around East Africa. My name is Lynn Komjisha. We start off with Kenya. Now, the Kenyan government has decided to evacuate Cuban doctors stationed in Wajil and Garissa counties bordering Somalia following the kidnap of two of their colleagues. Suspected al Shabaab terrorists kidnapped the Cuban doctors in Mandela and killed their armed escorts last week. Although the town has been tense, this was the first terror operation in months. The departure of the Cuban medic is likely to gravely impact health services in these counties. Kenya security has largely contained the al Shabaab activities on these border areas. The evacuation of the Cuban doctors is believed to be a precautionary measure. In Tanzania, a mother of five, Nana Maganga, on Saturday killed six children before she died under unclear circumstances. Maganga, using a machete, slashed her five children among them, were two-year-old twins and then her brother's child. It is alleged that she attacked and wounded four other children. Police has arrested five people in connection with this incident. From South Sudan, the military chief of staff, General Simon Duwal of the main opposition army, Sudan People's Liberation Army in opposition, has called on his troops to fully respect the permanent ceasefire agreement signed in June 2018. General Simon said the revitalized peace agreement signed in September last year must as well be protected, calling it the only hope for the people of South Sudan. Away from East Africa, we take a look at what's making headlines around the world. 
Alfred, we start off with the developing stories coming in from Sudan, the Sudanese Professionals Association, the umbrella group at the forefront of the protest, said an attempt was underway to break up the seat in outside the army headquarters in the capital, Khartoum. The SPA urged people to respond and protect their revolution by continuing to stage protests, according to a statement published on its social media pages. Meanwhile, Sudan's military council said it was restructuring the council and appointed Kano, General Hashim Abdel Mutalib Ahmed Babeka, as army chief of staff. Colonel General Mohammed Othman Al Hussein was appointed as Deputy Chief of Staff. From Somalia, the deputy leader of the Islamic State group in Somalia has been killed in an airstrike. Abdismad Mohamed Galan, security minister of the Puntland region, said the airstrike that killed Abdi Hakim Mohamed Ibrahim, known as Dokob, took place Sunday between the villages of Hall and Nord and Hiriro. Galan said the airstrike hit the vehicle Dokob and another passenger were traveling in and said both men were killed, but the other person has not yet been identified. Now, news coming in from Johannesburg. South African police have intercepted 167 rhino horns believed to be destined for Southeast Asia in one of the biggest such holes ever in the country. Two suspects aged 57 and 61 were arrested with the horns on Saturday and they had been tipped off about the suspect's vehicle. From the USA, negotiators have tempered demands that China cab industrial subsidies as a condition for a trade deal after strong resistance from Beijing, according to two sources briefed on discussions marking a retreat on a core U.S. objective for the trade talks. The world's two biggest economies are nine months into a trade war that has cost billions of dollars, roiled financial markets, and impended supply chains. U.S. President Donald Trump's administration has slapped tariffs on 250 billion US dollars worth of imports of Chinese goods to press demands for an end to policies, including industrial subsidies that the Washington says hurt US companies competing with Chinese funds. China. And finally, from New Zealand, the New Zealand Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern, who was praised at home and abroad for her handling of the Christchurch mosque's shooting last month, received her highest approval rating since taking office on a widely watched poll on Monday. And that was the latest from around East Africa and around the world. Coming up is the Pearl of Africa series. Thank you, Lynn. And now in our Daily Pal of Africa series, we look at Matson Falls and National Park. Now, Matson Falls National Park is popular because of its waterfall, which was then called the Kawalega Falls. The waterfall is located on the Great River Nile between Lake Choga and Lake Albert. However, there is much more to expect when you visit the Matson Falls National Park. Let's take a look. The Matson Falls National Park is a fun park national park. You will not exhaust in a day. Starting with the animals it harbors, to the lodges it contains, and most importantly, the popular Matson Falls. And if you have the adventure spirit, camping at Matson Falls National Park for a week is what I could recommend. And this time, you will feel, touch, smell, and see why Uganda is known as the Pearl of Africa. The Matson Falls National Park is located in the northern region of the Albertine Rift Valley. Getting to the park is a three hours drive from Kampala, Uganda's capital city, as you take the route through Gulu Highway. From here, you connect with Masindi Road to Karuma and eventually get to Pakwach in the western region. If you choose to get here by air, it takes just one hour. 
The park, which covers 3,840 square kilometers, was established in 1926 as a game reserve to shelter the Savannah grassland, which was pointed out by Winston Churchill in the year 1907. It is now recognized as one of the best national parks in Uganda, which receives over 20,000 visitors annually. The park is managed by the Uganda Wildlife Authority. Just to give you an indication, in the 70s, Maxion Falls National Park was the number one park in the whole of Africa. Um, its name, it was named after the president of the Royal Geographic Society. And it's one of the premier parks, the first parks to be made in Uganda. So it's uh, a park with history. It's a park with one of the most amazing resources. Uh, the fastest falls in the world is what you are going to see now. Um, amazing wildlife if you want to see the big five in their natural setting. The River Nile, the longest river in the world transacting the park. I mean, the best you can imagine in a national park is what you find here. That's why it's so special. Our adventure through Matson Falls National Park will be facilitated with game drives. With these, you are granted to have a closer look at even the fiercest animals. Uh, the monkey is here. The game drive continues, and there you see a number of antelopes. As our journey continues, the buffaloes cannot be missed. These wander through the exotic plants in the park. Uganda is endowed with giraffes, as these can be found in almost all the national parks in Uganda. Their local name is Entuga. A Luganda word. This language is popularly used here in Uganda. Wondering how they manage to feed on grass? Check this out. In the grass of the woods, many more animals wander around. These animals are of different species. The hippopotamus are also known far, as we are told they spend most of their time in water. Tomo Bongokelo, a tour guide, gives us an interesting story about the life of hippos at Matsun. We call it a hippo pool because this is where you see these hippos behind me here. That is where they live. Hippos normally live in schools, what we call schools, a school of hippo. That is a herd of hippo. And uh, they are territorial. They occupy one area almost for life. So this pool, this herd which is in this pool, doesn't go away. This is their territory. Even if they go grazing, they can walk five kilometers, ten kilometers in the night. By morning, they are back in this position. And they protect that territory. So in this school you are seeing there is a dominant male that is in charge of mating with the females which are here. And they normally mate in water also. They don't mate on land. And uh, when they produce the young ones, normally the mothers, when they are producing, they don't produce where they had, where the school is. They go and produce from somewhere. Now when they produce, then when the baby reaches a certain age, after some time, the mother brings it now to the herd, to the school. If it is female, it is accepted immediately. But a male may be rejected, a male baby may be rejected by the dominant male and kill immediately also, because he's fearing competition in future. But in the event that he accepts him, then now that one will leave until a time when they will have to fight also with the father, and when the father is defeated, the father goes away, or is killed, or when the, the, the son is defeated, the son is just away from the school. At this point, there is no other better way we could miss to take some pictures. To have a more clear view of the animals sailing on the Albertine waters using a ferry is another option. The number one among the big five, the elephant, also grazes and wanders through the Matson. The most common feature about elephants, whether in the wild or under captivity, they move in groups. The young ones are kept in the middle as the old ones take on the sides. Can the young also 
account. As we continue encountering with a cool breeze, we meet rare animals like the warthogs. Birds are also here. At the shows, crocodiles rise to catch the warmth from the soil. It's not the jaw, it's the eye which is most most is. You can fail to see the evergreen vegetation surrounding the shows. The moment that makes this adventure worthwhile is here, and it is the magnificent Matsun Falls. Let's ask the expert about these falls. Uh, currently we are at the top of the Matsun Falls. Uh, the top level from the point where the water falls through, uh, from the highest level to the bottom level, is around 45 meters. So this water falls through a narrow gorge of around uh, seven meters wide. That's the average being calculated of the gorge. So as a result, uh, when water is in the full capacity, like in the rain season, uh, around 1,000 cubic meters of water is believed to be passing here per second. So make it to be the most powerful waterfalls and uh, in the world. So uh, we are seeing currently there are some two blocks. One is on this side, one on the other side. In the early 1954, there was a footbridge being put by Sir Winston Churchill uh, after declaring Uganda to be the part of Africa. Sir Winston Churchill put a footbridge, uh, which costed him only 10 pounds to put this footbridge. But in the year 1962, we had some floods. So the flood made the gold to got congested and later it created a channel creating another waterfall which we have behind. The second waterfall. The second waterfalls uh, which we call it to be Ohuru in local language but that means uh, independence or it can mean liberty uh, because in 1962 Uganda got independence uh, from the British. So uh, in that same year is when this footbridge which was put by Sir Winston Churchill was wiped away by the flood. So from that time up to then, we don't have the bridge, we only have the two blocks. I must warn that whoever would wish to swim from the Matson Falls, it is highly prohibited. But what I could recommend are boat rides, swimming in the Lakzara swimming pools, and as well as sunbathing. They are quite affordable lodges with cozy beds you could enjoy after a long day. I can't forget the restaurants. While here, you can't miss the sunset on the water. Another plus at Matson Falls National Park are the cultural music dance groups. You can dance and sing to their tunes. Now for Mopal of Africa Stories, visit our website which is newvision.co.ug forward slash Pal of Africa. Our newspaper, The Sunday Vision, is also another home of adventures so get your copy every Sunday for Pal of Africa Stories. Now let's take a look at what is making news in business with Lynn in the handshake. Well, hello there. You're watching The Handshake here New Vision TV. My name is Lynn Komjisha. Now, I have with me Paul Busharizi. Paul, welcome to the show. Thank you. We have a, f a month or so to the reading of the budget or two. About two. Yes. Three. And uh, so the government has proposed new TAF tax measures relating to rental income, excise duty, and business licenses. Before we go into those three, there was a lot of confusion, you know, when they introduced the OTT, they introduced social media tax. And uh, what have they done about this before we get confused again? <laughs> no, OTT, nothing happened to OTT. <laughs> they adjusted the, the mobile money tax, which had uh, a bit of double, can you call it double taxation? Yeah, that, but that was before. Yes. We got confused before it, they were, it was rectified. What are they doing now? What is all this? No, it's, it's continuing. They're bringing useful revenues to the national coffers. Both How? Of them. Um, I forget the figures. Um, but I think OTT is expected to bring in what the budget was for 64 billion in this year. Mm -hmm. 
It's coming in well. <laughs> <laughs> well, well. So now we have rental income, excise duty, and business licenses. The new, the new tough tax measures. Why now? Well, first of all, we what need, have they we, been we, missing? We need, we need, we need, we need revenue. Yes, the true. Truth, the truth of the matter is that government is uh, has has taxed everything possible. I think uh, has has put in place tax measures for everything possible, and now they are trying to really adjust the ages of it right like one of the taxes which was actually interestingly was thrown out last year by the M mps was the one which they're trying to reintroduce this year is that if you're a business and you've made losses for seven years mm -hmm. they'll tax you 0 0.5 percent on your revenues going forward i think the idea is that look how can you be making losses for seven years and you're not out of business there must be something wrong so let's at least get something off the top uh, my worry right now is how am I going to understand these taxes? Have they put measures of, you know, sensitizing us about these taxes? Or do they just want to come and tax us? If they affect you, you will understand them. <laughs> I mean, OTT, everyone understood OTT. Oh, yes. Yeah, everyone understood. Oh, yes, money. I you agree. Them excise, duty. excise duty is mostly on uh, manufactured goods and stuff. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, people might not, if you're not a manufacturer, you might not feel it. <laughs> of course, you can understand it academically. A rental but. income. Yeah, rental income, uh, I think the, the proposal is that uh, if you have more than, uh, if you have more than uh, one rental property, yes. that you should pay on all the others individually. Oh. Uh, but I think this one is, is, is because I think some people own properties in their names. And in different places. Yes, so I, 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 don't, I, I think they're just going after people who own property in their place. I think the, the smart thing to do really is to have these properties in, under a company. Then you pay, I think you even pay, you less, pay at once. Less, less rental tax. Mm -hmm. mm. Oh well. Um, that aside, <coughs> I was discussing with my, one of my colleagues and uh, so he says every new budget is absolutely new. Like, this, like, like there was never a previous budget. We never get reports on uh, previous budgets. Why is this? No, that's not true. Um, because every budget, every budget, well, it's true and it's not true. Mm. Okay. It's true in the sense that every budget is catering for the, the needs and demands of the time, okay. whatever it is. So uh, if, for example, we needed to get, like last budget, we needed to get money from uh, uh, social media. So mm -hmm. OTT is put in. So <laughs> that's a thing that is... The, but there are things that recover over the budget, just that they are not mentioned, like income tax, right. tax on uh, on um, personal incomes, mm -hmm. uh, VAT, we have, I think they have not mentioned VAT in the budget forever, mm -hmm. but it is there. So it's just depending on the circumstance. That's how you should look at it. Uh, is there a balance brought forward at some point? A balance mm. from previous budgets? Yes. Well, the truth is that uh, not everybody, f interest shock sadly, shockingly, shockingly and sadly, not everybody who is given money completes their money. And some money actually is sent back to the treasury at the end of the year because people have failed to finish it. You, it's not like a home budget where you keep the money and then uh, let's just continue. No, well, if it gets <laughs> to June 31st and you've not spent the money, you send it back and you, and you get the new money. Why don't they give us those reports? Why don't you think we need them? They actually there. I think the Auditor General reports on it every year. And then what? But you people are not affected directly, so you're not interested. If they were talking about OTT tax, you'd be very interested. I think we'd be very <laughs> interested. Money tax. We're going to be very interested in the recent budget. Which one? OTT? No, no, no. Yeah. The recent, the, the one of 2018. Uh, 19. 19. Mm. Yes. Where would you be interested? I, I want to know how the OTT worked. Yeah, I want yeah. to know if... Absolutely, that's good. In fact, even just as a measure of education, we should tax things just so that people will be interested in the budget. I think so. The other day, somebody was proposing, uh, I think his uh, Nema was proposing a carbon tax, that carbon. every Ugandan should be taxed because we, we are depleting the environment. So this tax will be used to, to replenish the environment. So then everyone will be interested in, 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 in the budget. You see, now, we're not interested. The old days of where the finance minister would say, tomorrow, starting from uh, midnight, tomorrow, bread will be up this amount, milk will be up, those days are gone. So now people are not interested. Now we need to, I think, just as an education purpose, maybe yes. I, I'll propose it to the Minister of Finance. Uh, yeah, we should. As an education <laughs> tool. Yeah. Just tax everyone, so that people will be interested in this in, budget. In, in, in this yes. budget. So yeah. we know what happens. You see, even now we don't even pay graduated tax. Those days everyone was paying graduated tax. 
Oh, wow. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Lynn. In our special report, we can look at why the first post I mean, cabinet failed. The seeds of instability of the government that replaced Idi Amin's were planted in its womb right from its creation in the northern Tanzania town of Moshi. When it was clear that Amin's fall was imminent, several opportunistic, sectarian, selfish, and even some criminal elements descended on Moshi and joined the Ugandan groups that were meeting under the patronage of the Tanzanian president Julius Nyerere to chart Uganda's future. The jostling of jobs started right away in the cabinet that emerged was not in any way chosen by the president, Professor Yusuf Ule, who was picked to lead it. The internal bakering and intrigue started before the new leaders left Tanzania for Uganda. The bikering factions that formed the Uganda National Liberation Front seemed to agree on only one thing, that they must all return to Uganda and share the spoils. We must all go back, was the internal rolling call. They arrived in Kampala on April 11, 1979, sworn into office on April 13, supposedly as a team. But they included monarchists, Marxists, militarists, and even a few criminals, so they could hardly agree on the way forward after removing Amin. From day one, President Yusuf Ule did not enjoy the support of most factionalists as the main reason they had accepted him was that he was not aligned to any of them. Worse still, he was despised by some because he had not played any significant direct role in fighting Idi Amin. So he lacked moral command over the quasi military government. Lule could not satisfy the wishes of most players, and so he tried to use his constitutional powers to make appointments as he saw fit. So the ugly face of greed reared its head, and bitter arguments over jobs started to spill into the public arena. In the first place, not even a single minister had been appointed from the 99.99% of Ugandans who had been living in the country. A dubious divide between so-called returnees and stayees developed. All jobs went to the returning exilees, in apparent assumption that whoever had not come from abroad was either incompetent or corrupted. But even among the exilees in power, the fights for jobs were endless. Lule, being an academic, decided to allocate appointments to ministerial jobs following regional balance. He announced a reformed cabinet with an accurate statistical illustration to show how the so-called national cake had been distributed equitably. He had even reshuffled the powerful Paolo Mwanga out of internal affairs and made him labor minister. But the UNLF leaders were not satisfied. The interim legislature, NCC, chaired by Professor Edward Rugumayo, rejected the president's appointment, saying he had to make them with their approval. Lule tried to cite the 1967 constitution as being above the Moshi agreements. The NCC responded by overthrowing him. He was 68 years and spent 68 days as president. Another reason Lule was seen as very dangerous was making known his intention to recruit and reconstitute the army with proportional representation from all regions of Uganda without any single or few tribes dominating the armed forces. This appeared to be a direct threat to the UNLA, members who had been in the fight against Idi Amin but were coming from a few tribes. After the removal of Lule, Uganda underwent seven years of instability until 1986 when the NRM under Yoweri Museveni captured power, exercising firm control over most of the affairs of the country. That's all they had for you. Thank you for watching. Be sure to catch more news updates and other programs here on New Vision TV by visiting our website, which is newvision.ca.eug forward slash video. You can also follow us on social media. Facebook is The New Vision. Twitter is at New Vision Wire. Instagram is at New Vision Wire. And our YouTube channel is New Vision TV. Before we close, let's end with the fact file. <music>